Hello and welcome to the Ian Dale All Talk podcast, where we try to get to know people in politics and the media just that little bit better. Well, today we're going to talk to somebody who's been around the top of politics for, uh, well, I suppose since uh, really about 2000, 2001. He was first elected to the House of Commons in 2001 as a Conservative MP and held a multitude of shadow and ministerial roles uh, during the David Cameron leadership and indeed uh, his premiership and under Theresa May. Well, He's Chris Grayling. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Ian. Now, I always think that you are a little bit misunderstood. Do you think you are? Uh, I'm very frustrated by some of the coverage <laughs> I've had in recent years, some of which is complete nonsense. Um, but, so yes, there, there is that frustration, um, I have to say. Do, do you think sometimes, once you get a reputation, it is, it is very difficult to shake it off? Yes. I mean, the reality is that people form a view... Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I say this to somebody who works in the media, the media forms a view. They decide what the story is. Yeah. And the story is the story, regardless of what then happens. And there is this pack mentality as well, isn't yes, there? Yes, I'm to, afraid to so. Yeah, when... well, well, maybe we'll come on to a little, a little bit about that uh, later. I want to find out where you came from, what sort of drove you in your youth. And I think one thing that people don't know about you is that you actually spent quite a few years working in the media. So you kind of know how these things happen. Yes, I did. I mean, I I, I went to university, came out, um, was lucky enough to get a place on the BBC's news training scheme. I spent... uh, a period at the BBC. I went off to Channel 4 to work on its lunchtime business programme. Uh, went back to the BBC for a while to work on subscription television projects. And then really got involved in smaller businesses. Um, I won't go through the whole story now, but I ended up running part of two small production companies with more of a focus on corporate communication and training. Um, uh, and then I ended up Prior, immediately prior to becoming an MP as uh, so a change management consultant. So mm. I would honestly say my, my pre-political career was a bit chaotic, but actually it's ingredients to become an MP when you've, uh, you've worked in a newsroom, you've worked in an international business, you've worked in a small business struggling through recession times. It's, a, it's an interesting and useful mix of experience to have done. But I think actually in the back of my mind, uh, I, I was always interested in politics, always... Uh, thought one day I'd want to be an MP. And I think it came from the desire to make a difference, Uh, the desire to actually do things that make a difference, which, as a politician, you can to a greater or lesser degree, Mm. sometimes for individuals in the constituency, sometimes bigger things. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in Buckinghamshire in a small village, just a commuter village. Um, My father worked for a big oil company uh, on the plastic side and chemical side. Um, Went to the Royal Grammar School in High Wycombe. Uh, and then went to Cambridge University afterwards. And wh- where did the interest in politics come from? If, if I'm honest, I couldn't put a finger on it. <laughs> it was kind of always there. Um, uh, and I dabbled in it a bit. I um, uh, was a member of the SDP briefly uh, at university. Uh, I think I got fairly fed up with them after they had a big bust up with the Liberals over who was going to fight which seat. And actually, I spent far more time at university being captain of the Tempin bowling team than I did on political matters. Tempin bowling team? <laughs> Absolutely. What? Doesn't get better than that. Absolutely. We had some great <laughs> fun times. Um, uh, there was a, a league of three, which eventually expanded to four, and we played each other twice a year. <laughs> and so sort of duly travelled to each other's universities. And um, uh, it was a good laugh. So uh, I did that, and uh, I was also chairman of the Amnesty International Group at university campaigning for Russian prisoners of conscience. Uh, And then after that, went off and joined the BBC. Because you've got this reputation as a sort of fairly down-the-line right-winger, but a lot of your background would suggest that you're on the sort of left of the Tory party. Well, you see, I don't really believe in left and right these days. In fact, the reality is... No, but in those days, I mean, you would have defined things in left and right, wouldn't you? Possibly. Um, but I think, you know, people have different opinions. I know, is Ken Clark a left winger or a right winger? In some issues, um, he would be as right wing as John Redwood. Mm. Um, but on other issues, he'd be on the left of the party. I mean, I think it's, people have different views about different issues. So if you take right now, I mean, my big passion on the back benches is conservation. I feel passionately that we need to do more in this country and internationally to restore and protect the habitats of endangered species. Now, that's probably not what people think of me, but it's mm. something I've always been passionate about. But why do, why do you think you got that reputation? So, well, I, uh, it's a good question. I mean, in, in, in opposition, 
I became almost by accident the conservative attack dog. <laughs> uh, and it was pure coincidence. Uh, because you're, you're right, actually. I mean, I remember the, those days, and you were sort mm -hmm. of the, the one that they would put up on the Today programme to have a go. Yeah. Well, it started with a... Uh, I had an intern who didn't have enough to do. Uh, and I said, well, there had been some speculation about Tony Blair's holidays. So I said, go and have a look and see see what he'd done, where, where he'd been on holiday, what gift he'd accepted. And we discovered there was a, quite a big question mark over one of them. So I checked it out. Did a press release. Um, it made the, uh, the the lead story in the Sunday Telegraph on the day, sadly, of the tsunami. And I mean, sadly, to mm. that was a horrible day, a horrible event. Um, but after that, I uh, just ended up picking up. Everybody used to phone me up and say, "What do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of the other?" I always tried to be Mister Mister Reasonable. Um, I don't think in politics throwing mud in in a kind of hostile and angry way works. Uh, I think you just have to ask difficult questions. And I always made a point of asking difficult questions and just saying, well, you know, this shows a lack of judgment. You know, why on earth has he, he or she done this? But it became something I was just ended up being asked to do by the party and, you know, duly did my job in opposition of trying to challenge the government and um, you, you, ultimately get, get David Cameron elected. You're a bit like Norman Tebbit in a way, because you're quite softly spoken, but sort of there, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of menace there sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm less menacing than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I mean, I don't think you're, you're menacing, but you've got that reputation mm -hmm. um, and I think it was it was very much like Norman Tebbit in the early 1980s where he was seen as an out and out right winger sort of devoted to Margaret Thatcher but actually he was much more pragmatic and much yeah. more softly spoken than, than people really remember now I think that's right I mean people in politics do get pigeonholed and of course once people think of you know that way and of course mm. they, only, they only ever see the headlines mm. now very few people in in and around politics, get to know an individual well. There's just an awful lot of assumptions made. Who are your main friends in politics? So I suppose the answer is I have a very good close group of friends from 2001 who still meet up regularly. There's only two of us left, uh, Marc Francois and myself, um, but uh, a number of others who, who, who have left and gone on to other things, including Paul Goodman, who now edits Conservative mm. Home. Um, but I've also got a good group of friends in Westminster now. I'm going after this interview to have a drink with one of them. Uh, I, I do think it's important to, to have friends in Westminster and to get on with people. Uh, and I think if you asked people in the parliamentary party what they thought of me, I think they would mostly say they think I'm somebody they can get on with. Mm. Do you have friends on the other side? Uh, one or two people who I value enormously on the other side. So if I take one example, Stephen Timms, who... Uh, was my shadow for uh, when I was employment minister. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't particularly socialise with people from the other side, but um, he's somebody I value enormously and have always had a good relationship. And actually, ironically, with Chris Bryant, who was my opposite when I was shadow leader of the House and was always... Um, taking the proverbial at business questions, but actually behind the scenes, we've always had a good relationship. I see that quite surprises me in a way, though he's quite a sort of clubbable guy, yeah. but uh, and I think he's trying to get away from his reputation as being incredibly partisan and a bit, in a sense, I suppose, at one point, he was the Labour equivalent of you, real sort of attack dog, sort of hate the Tories, they're all corrupt and all the rest of it. But he's gone away from that now, hasn't he? Yeah, I'm not, I, he's a, a likeable man. Mm. But, but of course, people only see from outside what they see through the media. It doesn't actually necessarily reflect on the individuals. Because you can only really get things done, can't you, when, when you do have uh, people on the other side that you can say, well, look, I'm planning to do this, be really good to get some cross-party support on it. Yes, uh, and I think that there are moments when you do need to do that and moments when you pick up the phone to the person you're shadowing and say, look, this is a real issue, we've got to sort this out. When you first decided to go into politics, what, what did your family make of it? Well, so my wife has always been supportive. She knew I was always interested in uh, becoming an MP one day. I think she thought I would never actually do it. And then there were a few circumstances that came along that, that prompted me to do so. Um, 
Uh, I originally got involved in the Conservative Party through an organisation called the Bow Group, um, which was set up by Geoffrey Howe as a think tank for young professionals. It's moved away a little bit from that right now. Well, it's kind of moved away from but, the Conservative uh, Party, indeed. hasn't it, in many ways? But in those days, it was a, a group of young professional Conservatives, many of whom are still friends. And there's some of us in the House, Maria Miller, for example, mm. was a member of the Bow Group with me. Richard Bacon was a member of the Bow Group with me. So some of us ended up in Parliament. But I only came across the Bow Group because a very good friend of mine was lodging with a woman who was a very active member of it, who said, you know, you must come along. And that's one of the ways I got, actually originally got involved. And when you were first elected, I mean, it was a very safe seat. Um, what, what were your ambitions in politics at, at that point? Were you one of these politicians who thought, right, my aim is to be prime minister? Because, I, I mean, most people deny it, even if they did have that ambition. But I wonder what, where you, what was your dream job? Oh, I think the dream job would have to get to the cabinet not to be prime minister. I think being prime minister, uh, you, you've got to be a certain type of person. Personally, it's a mugs game. You give up your life totally. You can never really escape the limelight. Uh, and I like to have a private life uh, with non-political friends um, and family away from the office. And you, I don't think you can ever do that if you're prime minister. So no, uh, I, I would not want to be prime minister, and that was never an ambition. Um, to do well and to, um, to to rise up the ladder, yes, but not that far. Well, we'll come on to one of the jobs which I know you always wanted a little bit later, which you actually did get. But you said you wanted a private life. What What is sort of the private Chris Grayling like? Well, I mean, I hope to reasonably laid back, friendly, good friends, not involved in politics. Uh, and I think one of the things that I count myself as being very lucky about, um, there have been some sad marriage breakups in uh, Westminster recently. Uh, I'm very lucky to have a, a, a very sort of good marriage, very happy marriage and a very happy family. But one of the things that Sarah Vine wrote was that... Um, uh, there's not many politicians who spend time with their family. I pride myself over the last 20 years as an MP that I haven't been in that position. So I've, you know, always been there on the touchline on a Saturday to watch the, uh, the youth football games. Um, I've missed the odd parents' evening, but generally speaking, we've done everything we would have wanted as a family. And I've been very, very lucky. How have you um, managed to do that? Because there aren't many politicians that do well i'm very fortunate having a constituency in the southeast mm. which means you have one family home and um uh okay so i'm often in london particularly at the start in the early days as an mp when we had far more late sittings and when i was in opposition particularly uh working very long hours but you just have to make sure that the time is there and manage your time ruthlessly mm. You got on the shadow ministerial ladder quite quickly, I think within a year of being elected. Um, if you look at the years 2001 to 2005, I mean, quite a difficult time for the Conservative Party with the leadership of Ian Duncan Smith, followed by Michael Howard. Did you enjoy those years? I mean, as a new MP, uh, I have to say it is... It may sound an odd thing to say, but as a new MP, it's almost more enjoyable arriving in opposition than in government. You know, for example, you know, if you're a, a, a new uh, MP arriving in your parties in government and you get your first prime, prime minister's question, you know, it's a loyal and supportive question to the prime minister. Mm. Um, if you arrive in opposition, you can start to really challenge. Uh, and so actually you can achieve more in terms of impact in the House, I think, if you arrive in opposition than you do if you arrive in your parties in government. So from the point of view of us as a group arriving in 2001, there were 166 of us. Um, the party was still not quite in a state of shock, but still recovering from 1997. And you had an opportunity to make an impact quite quickly. Very different if you arrive as part of an intake of 100 plus people and you've won a general election. And of course, by the time um, 2005 came along, you'd already had two leadership elections. Well, there was the Ian Duncan Smith leadership election and then the Michael Howard non-election and then uh, the election of David Cameron. Where did you position yourself in all of those? So I didn't really get involved in leadership contests actively. So I arrived, William Hague went, um, IDS um, got the job. Uh, I actually, you know, I, I, I declared early on for Michael Portillo um, because I thought that... Uh, he was probably the right person to try and pick up the pieces after uh, a still difficult parliament. Um, I think IDS was underrated for the job he did, but um, it was clearly a struggle, and I think it was it was a shame what happened to him. Uh, I have huge regard for Michael Howard, um, and uh, again, Michael was elected unopposed, 
So again, my position there wasn't a question of positioning yourself mm. there. I think Michael was a actually a, a really good leader of the party. I have a huge amount of time for Michael. He's another, uh, frankly, uh, misunderstood figure. He is a charming man. He's a smart man. He's a decent man, uh, and uh, e enormously likable. The first time I really got involved in a leadership contest was after uh, the 2005 election when David Cameron stood and I actually ran Liam Fox's campaign. Uh, Liam I'd known since before I became an MP. Um, he was my boss in my first shadow portfolio in the health team uh, and I get on very well with him and it just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, and we, I think we fought a pretty good campaign at the start. We were rank, rank outsiders. In the end, uh, there are those who would say that they think that the Cameron team lent a few votes to David Davis to make sure that Liam didn't get into the last two. I, I have no idea whether that's true or not, but it's an indication that the story is around that suggests at least we fought a pretty good campaign. Yeah, I can I can remember those, those days very, very vividly, but I was never quite sure about all of that, I have to mm -hmm. say. Um, and then, of course, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to what happened between then and 2016. But of course, you also then ran Theresa May's leadership campaign. How did that come about? Um, it came about. Um, so this was the, the weekend after the referendum result. Uh, and I'd been very, very involved in the Brexit campaign. And uh, I came to the conclusion over that weekend that the person who took over from David Cameron had to be instantly credible as an alternative prime minister. There had to be somebody that the international community, the markets, uh, would all look at and say, yes, this is a person who's credible to be prime minister. And Theresa was a well-regarded home secretary who I've known for a very long time. Uh, and she contacted me and said, look, will you back me? Uh, and I'd thought about it and I thought it was probably the right thing to do. But having run Liam's campaign before, and because I felt very strongly that, you know, it wasn't just about having the right person. It also had somebody who you know, took on board the results of the referendum and the campaign that happened. I said, I'll do it, but I want to chair your campaign. And she said, I'm very happy you do that. Why did you think she was the right person? Because, I mean, it's easy to say this with hindsight, but she clearly wasn't, was she? No, look, it quite clearly didn't work out in the way <laughs> any of us would have hoped for. Or was it, was no it doubt, inevitable? That, or even if it, somebody else had taken over... It inevitably it would have ended in tears or do you think that there were things that she could have done that would might have changed the course of history? I mean I think it was an extraordinarily difficult period because she was Prime Minister in a government that was committed to leaving the European Union but in a House of Commons that didn't want to mm. uh, and I think that tension remained all the way through. The situation was made much worse by the outcome of the 2017 general election, which I'm sure she and most of us would think was a mistake. Though, in reality, I'm not sure if we'd been running up to a general election in 2020, that would have been much easier either. But it wasn't but, calling it wasn't a mistake, it was the campaign that was a mistake. Well, the campaign that, was a mistake. That showed her flaws to all and sundry. Yes, and I think also, um, frankly, there was a degree of expectation in that campaign that everyone thought we were going to win by a landslide and mm. people turned around and said, actually, we don't want that. Mm. Um, so uh, people sometimes shoot at our political system and say it's not right, our electoral system. My view is if you look back over the years, there is no perfect, flawless way of electing a government. But generally speaking, the country gets the, 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 the government that it's inclined to think is probably best for it. And I think on that occasion, um, Theresa started off you know, with a very clear position that she was going to win by a long way. And actually, I think the country went do you know what? We're not quite sure we want anyone to win by a long way. It might have overplayed its hand slightly with a hung parliament. But I think in 2017, the country did not want a landslide Conservative government and so backed away from, from voting for what could have been one. Now, you were in her cabinet all the, all the way through that. Did, did, was there a point when you thought to yourself, maybe I backed the wrong horse there? Uh, oh, there were points in which I thought about quitting. Um, oh, really? because um, I did not agree with the, the Northern Ireland pro Protocol particularly. Um, but also I'd agree with personal loyalty to Theresa. Theresa and I uh, have known each other for a lot longer than I was an MP, uh, and particularly Philip, her husband. Philip was my Conservative Association chairman in Wimbledon when I first joined the Wimbledon oh, right. Conservative Party locally. I've known them both for a very long time. Uh, and so there's a degree of personal loyalty. So I... I, I uh, did not agree at all with some of the decisions that were taken. 
but you know there are times when you're part of a team and you have loyalty to somebody and you bite your lip and i did and i thought loyalty was the right thing at that moment in time so you never got close to what obviously I mean, there were quite a few resignations to, during that government there wasn't a point where you nearly did it oh i thought long and hard about it but decided not to because I, mean, I also decided i have to say as a brexiteer uh, that when um uh, uh, yeah, some of the other resignations happened um and um i can't remember who it was who resigned and replaced by um was replaced by it was esther mcveigh resigned and was replaced by amber rudd it wasn't entirely clear to me how that helped the brexit group <laughs> within the cabinet so that was a factor as well you know does it actually help if i leave rather than staying in and arguing the case and did you have these conversations with her directly because i know others that did and they just sort of got kind of blank looks back and that they she listened but it was as if no one was at home. No, I think you won't tempt me on any conversations with Theresa, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, in a way, I mean, I, I'm not particularly trying to tempt you, but I, I just think that in in terms of the history books, it, mm -hmm. various people have had their say mm -hmm. and said, well, this is how it was. And some of the accounts really conflict with each other as to where she stood. And she hasn't really spoken much about it either. Now, I, mean, I think that the, the, the challenge that Theresa had was that, as I say, she was in a parliament where there was a majority, there was certainly a majority to stay in the single market. Um, there was certainly a majority to stay in the customs union. Mm. Um, but actually, the core of her party did not want to do that. Um, and she was also, you know, she's a thoroughly decent woman who was trying also to do what was right for the country. And, you know, if you think of all the analysis that we've had about what a disaster Brexit would be, you have to listen to some of that and try and weigh up the, the apparent risks of taking steps in a particular direction. As it's happened, I think all of the... Um, I'm not saying there's no hiccups around Brexit, but the, the, the worst forecasts have proved to be absolute nonsense. Um, uh, but, you know, if you're Prime Minister trying to balance an extraordinarily difficult political situation and trying to get the right balance for your country, um, I have no doubt that's what she was trying to do all the way through. So I, I would, you know, in the end, it did not work out for her, and I think it was very sad it didn't work out for her, but the one thing I'm absolutely sure of is she did the things that she thought was best for the country. Now, tell me the truth. Of, it's just occurred to me this. Tell me the truth of the, your short-lived tenure as party chairman. <laughs> um, well, I had intimations that I might become party chairman. <laughs> well, when was this exactly? So it was in January 2018, I think, right. wasn't it? Um, so I knew it was a possibility. Uh, and there was clearly a reshuffle happening, so I was waiting to see what was happening. Um, and then, of course, up pops the graphic on the BBC saying Chris Grayling to be party chairman, which I knew clearly wasn't true because nobody had told me that was going to happen. And then about... 20 minutes later, Brandon is announced as party chairman. There's lots of eggs on face in number 10. Um, uh, so, no, I, I, I'd be lying if I was saying I was terribly impressed about the events that day. <laughs> I think that's been very diplomatic. <laughs> Did you have your say on that? And uh, I mean, who was responsible for that? Uh, I've never quite got to the bottom of what <laughs> happened. I think, you know, as you probably know, with reshuffles, there's always allegedly the whiteboard with sort of mm. post-it notes on. And I suspect at one point I may have had the post-it note in the party chairman post and that may have moved back to transport. <laughs> I don't know. But um, one way or another, it was a bit of a cock-up, frankly. Um, however, I do have an impeccable record in my very short period as party <laughs> chairman because the Conservative Party never lost in any election of any sort <laughs> while I was chairman. <laughs> Um, let's go back to February 2016 and the moment that David Cameron, well, as he would say, did his marvellous deal in Brussels and others might say, well, it wasn't a very good deal at all. Um, had you decided even before that that you would be part of the Leave campaign or was was that the straw that broke the camel's back when he didn't really get as much as people had hoped? No, I'd, I'd intended all along to be part of the Leave campaign. I mean, one of the great ironies is that if you turn back the clock to the time I first joined the Conservative Party, I would have counted myself as a pro-European. Uh, I went on uh, visits to, to Germany with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Um, I think that the problem is it's the European Union that changed. Mm. You know, I would still, if the European Union was still a free trade area with a loose partnership between nations, I would never have argued for leave. Yeah. But my view was that, uh, I think particularly once the single currency was formed, uh, it, it, I don't believe you can have a single currency without a single government. 
in the end, it unravels. Uh, and I think that in the end, the European Union is going to have to effectively become a political union. It's a long way down that road anyway, but it's going to have to take the final steps. And you've seen that with the pandemic, mm. with kind of the, the collective bailout packages. Uh, and I, my view is that that's not right for the United Kingdom. I don't want us to be part of a federal super state. Uh, and, and the other thing is after, and I spent most of 10 years representing the UK on different European councils in Brussels. Uh, and there is, you know, I, I really good relations with lots of my European counterparts, um, really good people. We had some good constructive discussions, but underlying the culture of the system in Brussels is a view that it is the government of Europe. Uh, and it, it, it seeks to permeate further and further into the lives, the working lives, the, the ways of governing across the continent. And I, again, didn't, just didn't feel that, that was right for the UK. So I always intended to campaign for leave. Uh, and I would have left the government then. I mean, I, it's a matter of record that I went and saw David Cameron and said, look, um, I, I'm going to campaign for leave. Do you want me to resign? Uh, and in the end, we reached an accommodation whereby I didn't resign. But he said that you, you, you and others can campaign to leave and you can kind of raise your flag three quarters up the mast before I do my negotiation. How difficult was that conversation? Because David Cameron, uh, on the outside to people, looks very sort of smooth, urbane, charming. But he has got a bit of steel in him, hasn't he? And uh, some of these conversations, he could get quite sweary. No, no, he wasn't. It was a perfectly friendly conversation. He was a bit surprised, I think. I don't think I was top of his list as somebody to come and have that conversation with him. But um, I've always had a very good relationship with David Cameron. Uh, and I always made a point during the referendum of saying I was very grateful to him for giving me the freedom to do this. I mean, if you're looking for almost unique moments in a political career, uh, there's a very small number of us who managed to be in government and opposition simultaneously in 2016. You know, we were campaigning against the government we were part of. And that's an you know, almost unprecedented situation to be in. And I thought David Cameron was very big to allow us to do that from within the government. Well, when he called the referendum, did you think that it was winnable? Uh, I thought it was a long shot. Um, but actually, with hindsight, you know, I went all around the country uh, and got a good reception wherever I went campaigning for leave. So with hindsight, it perhaps should have been more obvious. But going up to polling day, I, I was always of the view we'd probably narrowly lose. But again, a unique experience is I will never again be greeted by cheering crowds in Caerphilly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so... so and actually, the, the funny thing is, I, I think that the referendum campaign paved the way for some of the political changes we've seen in the last couple of years with the kind of collapse of the Red Wall. Because what I think the referendum did is it enabled Conservatives like myself, but particularly Boris, um, to get out and engage with those people over something that wasn't party political tribal. Um, you know, I remember, again, getting a sort of standing ovation in the Victoria Hall in Stoke-on-Trent. Again, this is not normal, but Stoke-on-Trent's now a Conservative town. Mm. There's a lot of people who suddenly found themselves talking to Conservative politicians in a way they never had before. And I think that created the opportunity for, for Boris to do what he's very good at, which is to reach out to those people and say, now you can vote for me as a Conservative as well. We'll come back to your various shadow ministerial roles and minister roles in, in just a moment, but d just sort of finishing off the Brexit thing, you, you spent three years in Theresa May's cabinet and then Boris Johnson was uh, elected leader of the party. Who, who did you support in that leadership election? So I supported Boris. And he dumped you? Uh, I had already told him I didn't want to stay doing my current job. Uh, I mean, I frankly, I mean, as, as is well known, I had a lively time in the last few months as transport secretary, but I've been on, on the front bench for 17 years. Mm. Uh, and actually, my honest view was that it was time for my wife and family to have a bit more time. So I, I'd said to Boris weeks before, I do not want to carry on as transport secretary. Having had a lively time in those last few months, if he'd said, please stay and do something else for a year or two, I might have might have done, but he didn't, and I'd, I'd been very clear to him I did not want to stay in my current well, job. We'll come back to Transport Secretary in just a second, but I normally don't do these interview with en interviews with any notes in front of me, because mm -hmm. you've had so many jobs, mm -hmm. I thought I'd better get them right. So, um, before you joined the Shadow Cabinet, you were a whip, you were a health spokesman, and then an education spokesman under Michael Howard, yeah. but he then brought you into the Shadow Cabinet, Was that yeah. is that right? That's right, I was Shadow Leader of the House first. Yeah. And then I always think that's one of the best jobs to have. I think 
that looks, looks great fun, that job. It was very enjoyable. Because you um, almost do like a PMQs every Thursday, you don't do. you? do, and uh, it's it's the moment in opposition to wind up uh, Jeff Hoon, who was the leader. <laughs> no, I, I like Jeff, who was a good guy, but, you know, in the same way that uh, Chris Brown did to me, I wound up Jeff Hoon a bit. Um, and then David Cameron became leader and I became... Shadow Transport Secretary and then Shadow Work and Pension Secretary and then Shadow Home Secretary. And the irony is actually the jobs I did in government almost exactly mirrored the jobs I'd done in opposition. Mm. And which of those jobs, I mean, that, that when you became a, a minister, your employment minister, and then brought into the cabinet, uh, remind me now, I've now forgotten which what your first cabinet job was. So I was uh, Lord Chancellor first. Lord Chancellor. And then, and then leader became, of the House then leader, and then Transport, and then Transport Secretary. Secretary. Um, which of those jobs did you enjoy the most? I think bits of all of them. I mean, I wouldn't pick out one and say that was oh, up, 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 yeah, heads above the other. If I was to pick out the, the, the probably the thing that I enjoyed the most, it's probably not what people would expect. Um, I am the... So the, the, the job of Lord Chancellor goes back to the 11th century. The job of Lord President of the Council, I think, goes back to the 13th century. I'm the only person who's ever done both. Um, and what that both means is that you get to spend a, uh, a, a, a quite a lot of time with the royal family and the queen, because the Lord Chancellor is responsible for um, uh, being with the queen to swear in new bishops, and the Lord President chairs the Privy Council. Uh, and you know, it was an incredible honour to be able to spend not vast amounts of time, but spend time with the queen and to, to do both those jobs. So I, if I look back and say leave aside the politics, the things I've tried to do successfully and the things I've tried to do not successfully, but the thing I'm probably kind of most proud of is, uh, personally, the thing I've enjoyed most is, the, is the, 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 the two roles with the royal family. I know you're not going to tell me about any conversations because politicians never do, but w when, when you met her, was, was she different to how you imagined she would be? I've only ever met her once, but I found her so easy to talk to, whereas her reputation is of being a little bit socially awkward. No, not at all. She is a... She's a fantastic lady. She is good company. She's got a nice sense of humour. Quite waspish um, as well sometimes. Uh, but also um, uh, incredibly bright. Mm. Um, I've heard her in conversation with... Uh, well, I think the one thing I can say is that I was there when she swore in the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the conversation they had afterwards just brought home to me how much he, he's got experience of the Commonwealth. <laughs> she's very head of the Commonwealth, but she has an incredible grasp of what's going on. Mm. And uh, no, she's she's an extraordinarily impressive impressive woman. In a lot of the roles that you've undertaken, um, you have kind of become public enemy number one for certain groups of people. Like when you were justice secretary, Fathers for Justice took a great dislike to you, didn't they? They were protesting outside your home, I think. Well, that was it's, it's actually rather a sad case because it's not Fathers for Justice per se, it's one individual who lives in Surrey right. who um, clearly has had a very difficult time family-wise, who actually is, is kind of a breakaway splinter of Fathers for Justice. And he's been on my roof. Fathers for Absolutely. Justice. He's been on my roof, he's been on Jeremy Corbyn's roof. Uh, uh, he was prosecuted at one occasion and went on the roof of the court. Um, so I think it's, it's quite a sad case, actually. You know, the, um, uh, I think my fallouts over the years have been, particularly with trade unions. Um, uh, I have some uh, trade unionists who don't much love me, um, both from the justice days and the transport days. Um, but, no, the Fathers for Justice man, I thought, was rather a sad, sad situation. And I do feel... I feel very sorry, you know, as a devoted father, albeit two adult children now, um, the idea of being in a relationship that breaks up and you just lose contact with your children. I mm. mean, just agonising, mm. absolutely agonising. Prison reform, mm -hmm. um, that was quite controversial um, under your tenure as Justice Secretary as well. Um, you, you got quite a lot of flack for some of the reforms that you introduced, and some of them have been reversed now. When you yeah. see that, like, recently the parole um, reforms that you brought in, they, they seem to have been ditched. Does that sort of... Does that irritate you that they didn't work out, or do you think they did work out, but or they weren't given time to work out? Uh, I'm frustrated, those ones in particular. Actually, you mentioned prisons. One of the things I should say, again, if you want to surprise people, um, difference to myself and Ken Clark. Ken Clark, who was my predecessor as Justice Secretary, was planning to privatise 
all the prisons. I reversed that policy and kept them in the state. Most people might think it was the other way around. Absolutely. (laughs) The point about the probation reforms, and the most important part of the probation reforms is still there and I hope will always be there. Um, One of the reasons, this this was part, it was in the 2010 manifesto. Um, It was part of the coalition agreement. It was the thing David Cameron asked me to do when I took over as Justice Secretary. And the aim was to try and bring down the level of reoffending. Uh, and the biggest, most glaring part of the problem was that if you went to prison for less than 12 months, you were the most likely person to reoffend. Mm. But after you left prison, you were literally released onto the streets with about 50 quid in your pocket and just say, well, off you go, back to the same places and the same people you reoffended, you offended with before. It was a crazy situation. So the first thing we did was legislate to change that. So today, everybody who goes to prison is subject to probation and supervision after they've left. I think that's really important. That, to me, was by far the most important part of the reforms. The reforms also were trying to create a greater mix in the support provided uh, after people left, and that's the bit that didn't work in the end. We adopted the same approach that we had as a government in other sectors. We've done it for the long-term unemployed. We've done it for troubled families. And it involved a mixed economy of public, private, and voluntary sector working together. Uh, And... You know, if, if you listen to the inspectorate, you listen to the probation unions, they would say it was a disaster, it could never work, it could never have worked, it was a fiasco, it was a Chris Grayling flight of fancy, it wasn't actually, it was a coalition policy. But actually, frustrating, if you look at the actual detail, the figures published by the Ministry of Justice show that three years after the reforms launched, um, the reoffending rate was its lowest rate for 12 years. So, by definition, it can't have been the disaster that was suggested. Now, it didn't work in the way I hoped for a variety of reasons, most particularly because the numbers weren't what were forecast. So we kept the most serious offenders in state supervision and the lower risk offenders uh, were, uh, were the ones that were going to be supervised by a mix of private and voluntary sector. In the end, the numbers forecast, there were far more offenders categorised as serious who stayed within the state far fewer who were went to the outsourced operations. So the outsourced operation didn't get the money they expected and it created a downward start spiral of support that in the end is why the, why the reforms did not work in the way that was expected. But um, I, I, it remains my view that there is some really good practice out there to support offenders that is not exclusively in the, um, uh, the public sector. Um, and indeed now there's still in aspects of the support for offenders a mixed economy. But uh, no, I very much regret that it didn't work. But that's not a reason not to try mm. to do something better when it comes to stopping people reoffending. To say it was coalition policy, it was one of the most important things we did. And actually, one of the things you asked the misunderstood question, one of the things I do find frustrating is people, oh, this was some flight of fancy of Chris Graylings that he overruled all the officials about. You can't do that in government. This was a policy that was crafted by a government department, vetted across Whitehall, went through what's called the major projects review group that takes a major reform and pulls it apart, puts it back together again, Um, uh, gone through cabinet, gone through coalition approval. You know, uh, uh, and, you know, the the blame always gets pointed at me personally. personally, And I, I led it and I accept responsibility for the things that did not work out. But the idea that any individual can drive a reform massive through government on their own is just for the birds. Mm. It's just not true. Is it a frustration with with your experience as a minister in different departments that Mm. you almost know that you've got maybe two, possibly three years in, in a job and if you don't know the subject before you get made a minister, and most ministers don't, yep. you spend the first sort of six to 12 months reading yourself in, you then have a period when you can make some reforms, yep. and then the, the the civil servants in the department, they think, oh, well, he'll be, he'll be off somewhere else in a moment, and then they, I think there's a sort of bit of paralysis that sets in. How would you change the system I mean, because there are some ministers, like Ed Vasey, I think he sent for the whole five years of the yep. coalition in the same department. I think maybe he had some slightly different roles. Yep. But by the end of that time, he'd become really respected by the whole of the sort of arts That's and culture right. sector. But that rarely happens, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, if you take um, Sadge's return to get to government as health secretary, uh, I mean, Sadge is a really good guy. He's a smart guy. He'll do a very good job there. But he was saying the other day he's run six departments. I mean, yeah. that shouldn't really be the case. I mean, he's done it because he's good and he's moved in as a firefighter. But you do need the time to bed in to a department to get used to it. And uh, it is a disadvantage for ministers if they don't know 
the subject well. And yeah, it is certainly the case that civil servants sometimes go, well, you know, actually the minister will be here today, gone tomorrow. Um, so I'm a great believer. Uh, and David Cameron did do this. Uh, I'm a great believer in giving ministers a long period of tenure if you can. Um, let's talk about transport. Mm -hmm. Theresa May made you her transport secretary, which a lot of people were surprised at. I, I remember at the time thinking, well, Chris Grayling ran her campaign. He ought to be getting one of the big jobs. Mm -hmm. And you said at the time um, that you actually wanted the job as yes. transport secretary. Now, I can completely relate to that because mm -hmm. I've, I've told you this before. If I would ever got into government, that would have been my dream job. Yeah. Why did you want that job? Uh, it's because it's an area I've always been interested in, and it goes back to before I was an MP, I used to do work for clients in the transport sector. Um, uh, as a new MP, I was on the Transport Select Committee um, and uh, was then Shadow Transport Secretary. So, I mean, the answer is, it's an area I've always been interested in um, uh, and uh, an area I've always known a fair amount about. And uh, you know, I think Theresa probably, and here I'm speculating, uh, ironically, we have got what came later, but I think probably um, if I'd said and done nothing in 2016, I'd have become party chairman, which was effectively kind of what I was doing in the mm. campaign. Um, but I actually asked her if I could be transport secretary, and she appointed me to it. Uh, only, I say I only asked her after the event. I was very careful. Uh, I think all leadership candidates should not promise jobs before they've got the job. So I didn't ask her for any job at all until, until she got the leadership. And it is a job where you can actually do things. You're, yeah. you're not just trying to influence, you are doing stuff yeah. and, and hopefully making people's lives a bit easier. Yeah. What, what was, when you became Transport Secretary, did you have one or two things you thought, right, by the time I leave here, I want to have achieved this, that or the other? Yes, and I did. Um, I have believed for a very long time that Heathrow Airport needs to expand. And the number one item on my list was to get through Parliament the expansion of Heathrow. Now, the world has changed a bit then, since mm. then with the pandemic. It remains my view that Heathrow will probably be expanded in the end. It won't be in the same time frame because the pandemic has done huge damage to the aviation sector. But I do not believe that London, global financial centre, um, important international capital, should have a situation where its principal airport is constrained the way it is. Um, now, those, given my interest in environmental issues, people will be saying, how can you support aviation and believe in environmental matters at the same time? My view is, and I've spent time talking to the companies who are operating in this field, that by the middle of the 2030s, we will be well down the road to doing short-haul flights powered by aircraft uh, fueled by hydrogen, uh, and that by the time we get to the middle of this decade, the opportunity to go longer haul and that will be there. Um, so I see no reason. If we can produce environmentally friendly aircraft, which I believe we can, certainly with hydrogen as the fuel, and hydrogen is so important to so many aspects of how we deal with environmental issues going forwards, then why would we still leave our principal hub airport to the point where planes have to fly around in circles for half an hour before they can land there? So that was, to me, the most important transport infrastructure thing that this country needed. And we got to the point where it got through Parliament, and in the end, the inevitable court case came, um, and we won that in the Supreme Court a bit after I'd gone. Well, what's been your experience, both in transport and maybe other roles as well, of the, the agencies within departments? Because some of them, to me, seem to be a law unto themselves. The Highways Agency, uh, I think that's been a, a monumental failure as, as an agency because there isn't the political control that possibly there ought to be. And therefore, they do things which, had they got some politi more political control, they, they wouldn't be able to get away with. Was that your experience? T to a degree. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, what we described about ministers coming and ministers going, that is always, if you, you're in a job for five or ten years and the minister's there and may be there for 12 months, you've got to find the balance between just kind of pursuing the minister's pet project mm. and actually really being responsive to, to government direction. And so there is a tension there, and that tension doesn't always um, uh, 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 lead to the, to the best places. And, you, and you're right, sometimes some of the agents, agencies are complete laws unto themselves. And yes, I had some run-ins with Pirates England, although I actually did respect the team who ran it, and we had some lively debates on occasions. <laughs> um, but I think the thing you have to remember about the public sector is that it is full of people who are trying to do the right thing. OK, you've got careerists and you've got people with ambitions and that's natural and normal. But generally speaking, both on the political and on the agency and on the civil service side, you have a collection of people who are really genuinely trying to do the right thing. 
probably the biggest problem, in my view, is that the public sector is too risk averse. You know, there are times when the 80% solution is the best option and trying to say, well, well, that might happen and this might happen. Now, one of the things that creates periodic stories in The Guardian about government are leaked risk registers. Now, the public sector always produces risk registers for every project, which come up with all the possible risks that could happen um, if the project doesn't work out. And these then get leaked and it turns into government warns that this will be a disaster. I do think sometimes we overplay that. It's, it's sensible to look at a project and say, right, what do we need to be wary of? Mm. But the, 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 the public sector is held back by the fact that it is just too risk averse, in my view, whereas the private sector will take risks and accept sometimes you'll get it wrong, sometimes it'll fail, but you need to do that in order to get the successes. Now, you've alluded to this um, earlier on, but you, you had a very uncomfortable time towards the end of your tenure mm -hmm. as Transport Secretary. Sort of virtually every day or every week, there were headlines sort of failing, grayling. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how did that affect you personally? Uh, it's incredibly annoying, particularly when it's often based on stuff that's nonsense. So the, the one that people would quote is, Chris Grayling gave a contract to a ferry company with no ferries. Well... Yes and no is the answer to that. Um, <laughs> well, so, I so, it didn't. So, so, so we gave a contract to... We, we had three bids for a contract, one of which was from a startup company. So we gave it a contract that said, basically, we're not going to commit to paying you any money unless you deliver the service. And so, fine, if you can get your service up and running and we'll buy some tickets on it, that's fine. But if you don't, we won't pay any money. We never paid them any money at all. Um, they were actually backed by a credible Irish company um, they were looking to buy two ships from one of their potential competitors through a third party, which meant that we couldn't talk too much about what the business model was. But a journalist decided this was the most exciting story that they'd ever discovered, the ferry company and their ferries. And as you said earlier, the pack tends to pile in. But, you know, no matter how often you said, we're not spending any money on this unless we get the service that we are asking for, They'd still, so we gave the, gave the uh, contract to a ferry company with no ferries. Now, the truth is, if you get, get a plane next week, you're probably on a plane that's owned by a leasing company, not by the airline mm. itself. But, you know, this is the, I'm afraid the pack, when they decide a story is a story, will just chase it regardless. There's no sense of nuance in these things, is there? It's, no. it's one thing or the other. It and, is. and a minister is either totally brilliant or totally useless. Yeah. But you have to expect, accept that. You know, I was doing it for 17 years. I've had good times. I've had times when people say Chris Grayling's the rising star. I've had times when people say Chris Grayling's the biggest idiot on the planet. Actually, neither of those things are true. <laughs> I'm just a bloke getting the job done, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But actually, I look back and say, you know, the, the three things that were most important to me to do in government all of them actually happened. The employment programmes that I put in place as employment minister, most of them are still going to 11 years later. The prisoners who went to prison for less than 12 months who used to be released on the streets with no supervision aren't released onto the streets anymore with no supervision. And we've got the expansion programme for Heathrow Airport, which I hope will happen one day. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm comfortable with the things I really set out to try and do. But having got the job that you wanted as Transport Secretary, you clearly felt that by the end you couldn't carry on with it because, for whatever reason, it, it, the, the perception was that it was all going wrong. Well, yes, but also I was just tired. You know, 17 years on the front bench. Um, and actually, I think... So I actually told one of my staff nine months before that I wasn't intending to stay beyond the next reshuffle. Mm. And you just reach a point when actually you realise that you've done it, done it for long enough and I'd reached that point. Now, I would really rather have had a less turbulent last few months, but I had decided before that I didn't want to carry on any longer. And it's quite, it is nice to get your life back. It's nice not to worry about there's the phone ringing at the weekend, you know, with a crisis you've got to deal with. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm uh, 17 years as a front bencher. I was in the cabinet and shadow cabinet for 12 years, you know, under three different leaders. That's long enough. And you were slated to be Dominic Grieve's successor as chair of the Security and Intelligence Committee. Now, that didn't happen. Um, d is there a part of you that feels a little bit bitter about that? No, no. It's uh, a little annoying, but no, I mean, I've got things keeping me busy. And say, I'm actually, uh, having kind of bedded down out of government, decided I really want to concentrate on the environment and conservation issues, and that's what I'm doing. I would have liked to do the ISC uh, and, you know... I would not personally 
have teamed up with all the opposition MPs to prevent one of my colleagues from mm. getting a job. Which is what Julian Lewis did. But, you know, that's his call, not mine. Um, but, you know, it was an election I didn't win. I mean, that's life. Mm. I won most elections I stood in. It was one I didn't and, win. I mean, you and I are more or less exactly the same age. I mm -hmm. think two months, two months older than me. So we're both going to be 60 next year. Now, mm -hmm. I regard that as a pretty awful landmark in some ways. Mm -hmm. 40, 50 didn't matter to me at mm -hmm. all. What does 60 mean to you? 60 means to me it's time to enjoy things, particularly spend time with wife and family. Um, because, so I was with a group of old university friends at the weekend and we're all kind of looking in the direction of you know, 60s and 70s and you realise that actually you've only got a certain number of years and you actually have to, you know, it, it's fine chasing jobs, being ambitious, doing interesting things professionally, but there's also comes a time we've actually got to kind of step away and get a life but again. But you see, we're weird as a country, aren't we? Because if we were in any other country now, or mm. most other countries, I mean, 59, 60, that's the time when you're supposed to be at the peak of your political powers, or indeed a bit later. You look mm -hmm. at, I think, I don't know how old Michel Barnier is, but I think he's way into his 60s, yes. and he's now um, presumably thinking about running for president of France, mm -hmm. and yet we're, I think we're both sort of got the mindset, oh, well, let's just wind down a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying focus on my constituency again and I've always enjoyed doing the constituency work you can do less of it in government so being a back, the point about being a backbench MP is you can do things you're free to do things that you want to do um, and you're free to, to concentrate on trying to make a difference for the area you represent and um, you know as I said an example I've always been passionate about conservation um, I believe very very much that we need to um, uh, to, to, to invest more in rewilding around the world. I am the parliamentary species champion for the hedgehog. And I think we need to create... <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to do more in this country to recreate habitats, you know, replanting hedgerows, case in point, which used to be good habitats for animals. Um, do you know, that, that, that sparks a memory for me because mm -hmm. my, my dad had a small farm and I remember in the early 1970s when I would have been, what, 12, 13, he started taking all the hedgerows out to make the fields bigger. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know what you're doing that for because when you're dead, I'll put them all back in. Yeah. <laughs> and we do need <laughs> to do that. And actually, <laughs> some of the things the government's doing are really good. So if you look at the agriculture bill, you know, moving away from the European Union and its kind of fixed approach to agricultural support that's very much geared to small holding as in France, you know, we can now incentivise farmers to have bigger fields margins which makes a real difference to the wildlife mm. you know to wildlife corridors to habitats and so forth so how long do you think you'll stay in parliament because you are at an age where you could go off and do something different yeah i mean the answer to that is i don't know um i, I can absolutely guarantee i will not be in in parliament when i'm 72 uh that i have absolutely no intention of whatever we're doing how many more years i do don't know as, as long as i enjoy it i guess well, Chris, I'm going to be really interested to see what the reaction is to this interview because I did a similar one with Andrew Ledson not that long ago and I had so many people contact me, either on social media or emails, saying, I saw him in a completely different light. And I wonder, I wonder if I'm going to get the same for you. We'll see. Let me know. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you very much for joining us on Ian Dale All Talk. Join us again next week. Goodbye.